Ricky Stenhouse Jr. wins by six one-thousandths of a second. We have the largest wreck ever in NASCAR Cup Series history. And now we head to the Roval with no playoff drivers having to win yet. Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. picks up his fourth ever NASCAR Cup Series victory on Sunday at Talladega. All four of his wins have come at Daytona or Talladega, two apiece. Who is he, Michael Waltrip? At this point, for Stenhouse, though, this win comes at a really pivotal time. His team, of course, is losing their sponsor, Kroger, at the end of the year, likely headed to Roush Fenway Keselowski Racing, picking up a win um, at a time where his team owner, Brad Doherty, is in North Carolina helping with Hurricane Helene efforts and everything that went into that. Ricky mentioned that as well. Uh, just a good feel-good moment for that team and their non-playoff driver. They were just the disruptors, as Ross Chastain says. Stenhouse picked up the win, uh, beat out Brad Keselowski by six one-thousandths of a second. And that sounds really close, and it is, except it's still only the third closest finish in the NASCAR Cup Series this season. Obviously, Atlanta earlier in the year was very close between Ryan Blaney and Daniel Suarez, and then the finish at Kansas, the closest ever finish in NASCAR Cup Series history, one one thousand of a second between Kyle Larson and Chris Buescher. The finish uh, back at Atlanta between Suarez and Blaney was, I believe, three one-thousandths of a second. So now they've doubled it to six one-thousandths of a second, which is still incredibly close. And William Byron tried to make it a three-wide finish there at the end, but the race really was between the 47 and the 17, uh, you know, getting to the line. Stenhouse gets out after the race, celebrates, didn't, you know, say 1776, we are the champs or anything like that. He did go up and climb the fence, straddled it, and then climbed over and hopped into the flag stand went down to the fans climb back up hop back from the flag stand to the fence and then climb back down i know somebody from osha was having an absolute conniption on sunday watching this they're like oh my god he's 10 feet off the ground he doesn't have a tie-off point this is highly illegal did not matter turns out stenhouse is just an everyday spider-man from olive branch mississippi uh, he did get out and thank all of his Southern and Mississippi fans that were were there. It's what happened in the laps prior to the finish of this race that's going to have everybody talking. We had the largest wreck ever in NASCAR Cup Series history by car count. We have to desperately get some clarification on what DVP and what damaged vehicles actually are at this point. And we had a pretty solid race up until, well, the last four laps when chaos absolutely ensued. So... Let's get into it real quick. But before we do that, was this a good race? I'm going to give this race off the top an 85, I think. I think an 85 is a solid number for this, especially for a Gen 7 race on a super speedway. I really enjoy this race. Yes, we know that they're saving fuel. That's why they go three wide. That's why they go four wide. The fact that they're still running four wide, you know, six rows deep is wildly impressive. And that they didn't wreck is also wildly impressive so as much as people want to talk about that yeah i get it we would like to see them race all out we're not getting that right now no car slipped over that is a big time plus we had um good passing we had good strategy as well we had a great finish and honestly like it gave us a ton of storylines coming out of it which i think we're all here for so at the start of the race, the 99 car of Daniel Suarez had to serve a drive through penalty for making an unapproved adjustment pre-race to the roof of the car. Um, NASCAR wasn't happy with that. He does a drive through Of course, now he's out there by himself. And when the pack comes up to put him a lap down, he d goes all Joey Logano, parks in the center, and is like, you guys have to go around me. And the field does that. They go around him, and he's dropping through the field like he's Alabama in the polls. And he gets down, and he tries to slide up in front of B.J. McLeod in the top lane uh, with, like, an ARCA level of awareness. Even Alabama native Helen Keller would have known that you can't fit into there, and she can't hear nor see. But... She would have known that he wasn't going to make that happen. He tries to go up there, clips himself off the nose of the 78, and then spins down, brings out the first caution of the day, and that kind of set him on the back foot um, going in. And he desperately needed to get stage points in this race and or win this race, neither of which happened for Suarez. And he heads into the Roval in a must-win position. And I think it's safe to say he's likely not advancing on to the round of eight. From there, though, we had a really solid battle up to the stage break. Yeah, they were saving fuel, but four wide by four rows deep and five, six rows deep, as you can see in the photo here, is pretty mesmerizing. And the fact that they all continue to go around like that and not wreck each other is impressive. Oh, they're only racing at 60% throttle. Okay, you go out there and do it. You probably can't. So it was still impressive to see. Chris Buescher goes on to win stage number one. He's not in the playoffs, so it doesn't really matter for him. But drivers like Alex Bowman, Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, Joey Logano, and Daniel Suarez did not score stage points in stage one, which 
maybe actually didn't matter because of what happened towards the end of the race. In stage number two on lap 94, the field are making their green flag pit stops and Martin Truex Jr., who is still like 0 for 79, I believe, on super speedways in his cup career, came sliding into the pits sideways like he was playing postseason baseball. He was not safe. He managed to get going again, but at the end of stage two, this is where things get interesting. Austin Sendrick, who came into the day below the cut line, also exits the day below the cut line, we'll get to that in a second, needed to win stages. He needed to score stage points a lot like he did back at Atlanta because Atlanta helped carry him into the second round, the round of 12. He gets a stage win in stage number two. Great for him. But his teammate Ryan Blaney got you know hung out coming to that green-white checker for the stage finish as he's fading back. The 48 of Alex Bowman is getting a push from behind. Bowman runs into the back of the 12 car, turns him into the outside wall. Blaney's day is done. He takes out uh, Ross Chastain. Chastain's car is just billowing smoke like it, it had just gotten bombed out. Thankfully, it didn't. He gets out of the car. He looks pretty, not shaken, but like, dang, that, well, that was a hard hit uh, type of situation. The car was camo, though, so we really didn't see uh, that car come to a rest until he climbed out and we saw his helmet. And we're like, okay, there, there he is now. Blaney did turn some laps under caution uh, to try to make up a couple of spots. It didn't really matter for him. He finally came to a stop on the backstretch and had to have the car towed to pit lane. I think that might be something that NASCAR needs to look at just because it was a waste of time for him to go out there and do that and kind of extended the period of the caution. Either way, Blaney was not happy with Bowman and was like, we just got effing ran through. All right, I get why Blaney's upset, but like, if you sit back and look at it, there's nothing Bowman could have done there. What do you expect? You, you want him to just hit the brakes coming to the stage in and, and sacrifice points for your race? Like, that's just not going to happen. Plus, he was getting shoved from behind anyways. So, yeah, he just ran through the uh, 12 car like he was Derrick Henry. And it's unfortunate for Blaney, but that's just kind of the nature of speedway racing now, unfortunately unfortunately, when you're coming to the stage in. If it wasn't the stage break, yeah, there's a good chance that Bowman maybe tries to back off and at least not hit him as hard, but like everybody needs points. Everybody's trying to advance to that next round. Stage number three consisted of a lot of three wide, four wide, and then double file racing as people continue to try to save fuel, wait for their fuel window to open. Uh, AJ Allmendinger looked really impressive in stage three, even Shane Van Gisbergen. Uh, for this being only his sec first time, first year in the NASCAR uh, series, uh, in a national series, but you know, what is this? This is only his second time ever at Talladega in a cup car, uh, fourth time ever in a race at Talladega. He has really taken to super speedway uh, racing well, like it's actually pretty remarkable how good he is at it with how little experience he does have. The college cars, along with Beard Motorsports, all pitted together before everyone else did in that third stage. And that kind of doomed them from at least being in contention for a win of this race. But like AJ Allmendinger was leading when they came to pit road, Shane Van Gisbergen also in contention. And then where they pitted at and just trying to get back together never worked out for them. And then the big wreck ended up happening. But for the most part, it was a lot of fuel saving there at the end until everybody pitted, and then it was just balls out towards the end of the race. And that's what happens with four laps to go. Austin Sendrick is leading. Brad Keselowski is getting a push from Joey Logano. Austin Sendrick, Joey Logano, teammates. And we've all had this happen to us in Drafty Car. Austin Sendrick catches a push from behind and immediately turns him right into the outside wall and takes out 28 cars, the largest ever wreck car count-wise in the NASCAR Cup Series history. I tweeted out, I said... Damn, that was the entire field. And I wasn't joking at the time because like five cars did make it through seemingly unscathed. Um, there was a lot of cars involved in that accident. You had big time players, Chase Elliott, Joe Logano, Austin Sendrick, um, amongst others that were involved in that wreck. But you had big time playoff drivers involved in that wreck. Chase Elliott, Alex Bowman, Austin Sendrick, uh, Chase Briscoe, Joey Logano, and then you had other cars that were fast all day like Chris Buescher, Michael McDowell, Todd Gillen, um, a handful of guys, not a handful, multiple handfuls of guys involved in that. Harrison Burton, Noah Gragson, like the list, there's 28 guys, like the list goes on and on for that. Uh, scooting out of that wreck, like a phoenix rising from the ashes was Christopher Bell. I don't know how he came through the center of that and didn't get touched, but it was a remarkable save and drive by the 20 car to not get caught up in any of the incident there. Kyle Larson, um, Kyle Busch, William Byron, Ricky Stenhouse, Brad Keselowski, Christopher Bell, they all kind of came through pretty unscathed for the most part. Stenhouse had a, you know, a donut on the side of his door from contact that happened with Cendric there as everything broke out, but a wild wreck to red flag this race. 
And that's where things get interesting because you have a bunch of cars stopped on the racetrack, drivers refusing to put their window nets down. Richard Boswell told Chase Briscoe, put your hand over the latch of the window net. Do not let them take your window net down. Now, if you go back to Kansas last week, Josh Berry was involved in the first lap incident. He got tagged, spun, no seemingly no damage to his car, but he had four flat tires. NASCAR says, well, because you can't drive that car back to your pit box, you're done for the day. They hooked him up drove him to the campground and dropped him off and said, yep, your day's done, bud, because of that. You're on damage. You're a damaged vehicle. Now at Talladega, you have a bunch of damaged vehicles. Chase Elliott, Chase Briscoe, Alex Bowman, a bunch of guys that needed help getting back to pit lane. NASCAR tows them back to pit lane, lets the teams fix those cars and put them back into the race. Well, they were definitely involved in an accident. I saw them involved in the accident, actually. I saw the smoke. I saw them crash into other cars. They were in the wreck. And now they got towed back to pit lane and allowed to re-enter the race. Why is that? We absolutely need clarification on that. We always talk about NASCAR being consistently inconsistent. And Brad Moran, to his credit, last week on Sirius XM NASCAR said that what happened with Josh Berry is something that they need to look at and something they need to fix. Did they fix it? In this week, did they update the super secret rule book that nobody has access to? Because Chase Elliott should have been out of this race. Chase Briscoe should have been out of this race. Alex Bowman likely should have been out of this race. A lot of those cars should not have been allowed to enter back in the race based off of how the rule reads and what took Josh Berry out of that race last week. So I would really like some clarification on this because it was bad. It wasn't very good. And uh, yeah, not really sure how that goes. So we have a two lap shootout there at the end. Also, Caution comes back out, pace car didn't start to roll, uh, but people got to work on their cars. Yeah, there was a lot of people on pit road that weren't happy about that one either. We get back to green flag racing and green white checker there at the end. They didn't wreck. They end up uh, coming to the checker flag. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. picks up the win. Brad Keselowski probably had a shot to block um, and maybe take that win, but he didn't take it. And at the end of the day, Dixieland Delight is going to be playing for Ricky Stenhouse Jr. tonight because he captured his fourth ever NASCAR Cup Series victory. Big time for him. Your top 10 consists of Ricky Stenhouse Jr. with the win, Brad Keselowski coming home second, William Byron in third, uh, Kyle Larson in fourth, Eric Jones, a top five for that Legacy Motor Club team. They desperately needed that. Chris Rebell in sixth, Justin Haley in seventh, Austin Dillon in eighth, Bubba Wallace in ninth, and Denny Hamlin in tenth. Denny Hamlin was absolutely irrelevant all day like Auburn football has been this year, but he is in a really good spot to make it into the round of eight now, as, assuming he survives the Roval, which brings us to our point standings now. The points as they stand, William Byron has locked himself into the round of eight on points alone. Uh, he's the only driver that goes to the Roval feeling comfortable, or at least knowing that he doesn't have to worry about the chaos that may happen there. Chris Rebell's plus 57, Kyle Larson plus 52. They are definitely in a really, really good spot. Uh, assuming they score stage points next weekend um, at the Roval, they're likely locking in as well. They are in very comfortable positions. Uh, when I put out my tier list on Monday, those top three will be my contenders currently. William Byron appears to have been woken up finally, which is a good thing. They probably need to win though. Uh, Denny Hamlin, was in a precarious spot heading into this race now, but he exits plus 30. That 11 car quietly didn't make any noise all day and gets moved right back into contention. He is in a good spot heading into the Roval and to transfer to the round of eight. Alex Bowman entered the day plus eight over the cut line, exits the day plus 26. Running over Ryan Blaney, actually good in this situation for him. He's in a good spot as well. Ryan Blaney, Plus 25 on the day. He lost three points uh, to the cutoff line.